when you see the brilliance of the immune system and how the organs work and how you can actually propel this into a monstrously effective way to stay young and to prevent everything from cancers to heart disease to diabetes, you start to realize how convoluted our ideologies, philosophies, and education have been on health. They are completely the opposite of what it should be. Are you curious about discovering ways of making your life better? Then welcome to my podcast. I'm Bob Nickman, and this is The Exploding Human. Listen in while I talk with all kinds of people in the fields of personal growth, health and healing, alternative therapies, psychology, spirituality, environment, and the future. I'm looking for those answers that make life better for everyone. You'll meet cutting-edge practitioners, doctors, artists, filmmakers, business people, and those who have overcome challenges. The brave, the curious, anyone who's out there helping us humans to explore, expand, and explode. Hi, welcome to the show. This is The Exploding Human. I am Bob Nickman. My guest today is Brian Clement from the Hippocrates Health Institute in Florida. More about that in a second. First, I would like to invite you to visit my website, theexplodinghuman.com. If you go there, you can see photos of all my guests, listen to all the episodes, synopses on the shows, a little bio on myself, and there is a donate button if you'd like to support the show through patreon.com. It'll take you there. And if you support the show, you will have access to special content. So I appreciate that. I also have a YouTube channel, The Exploding Human with Bob Nickman, Ed with Bob Nickman, and you can listen to the episodes there, as well as The Exploding Human Facebook page. So check that out. My guest today is Brian Clement. He is the co-director of the Hippocrates Health Institute, and we are going to be talking about optimal health how to achieve that, his personal story of being overweight and having physical issues, foggy mind, all kinds of things that happen from uh, the American diet, which usually consists of meat and lots of sugar, and how he transformed his life and how he has transformed the lives of many thousands of people through the Hippocrates Institute. Also, I want to say that I uh, it was a long interview, so I took... 20 minutes of it where he talks about the pandemic and COVID-19, and I am putting that as extra content on the Exploding Human Patreon, so you can access that whole section on uh, his take on the pandemic. So uh, go over there and uh, support the show that way. That would be great. So I don't want to say too much before he comes on. It was a great talk. He's highly opinionated in the best possible way with an open mind and a sense of humor. So I love talking to the guy. I mean, I could, we went for a really long time, and I could do more, and I probably will down the road. But without further ado, uh, here he is. This is Brian Clement. Glad uh, we finally got to, uh, to talk, and uh, we're going to talk about the Hippocrates Institute, uh, eating healthy, maybe you get into some pharmaceutical things. Um, and, you know, when I had Tim James on my show, if anybody wants to listen to that, Tim is what, who turned me on to, to your, um, to the Hippocrates Institute. And he uh, was talking about his, the remarkable transformation that took place when he went there. He had many uh, physical issues and um, also a cloudy mind, <laughs> which is also part of fairly common out there today. Yes. Ill, yeah. Right. Ill, you know, and, and I'm just going to go political for one second here. When I look at the people in Washington in charge, they're all overweight pink men. <laughs> oh, it's, it's outrageous. I mean, I think, I think if you, you give me a week with them, I'll give them colonics and straighten out their diet. And all at once we'll be singing Kumbaya. <laughs> <laughs> now people now, and even Tim said this, let we could talk colonics cause I've done them. Uh, and, uh, and I sure, do in California. I mean, it's a prerequisite to be a citizen of California. Exactly. You can't it's, get into the state <laughs> right at the border of the Nevada and California. There's a colonic. <laughs> and Arizona <laughs> frowns upon it. <laughs> so, uh, or, or do they brown upon it? I'm not sure. <laughs> they, they, 
<laughs> yes, there's certain mandatory woo-woo things you have to do to get into California, but not really. It's a you know. Well, I love California. Let me yeah, tell me you. Me too. And yeah. you know, there's a huge conservative movement here too, as well as a, the liberal side. So it's not. Thank all God, one it's not thing. as big. Maybe not. Maybe outside <laughs> the cities, it probably is is bigger yes. than yes. Orange County. But we're not talking that. We're talking. We're going to talk about health and. Let's let's go back a little bit to how you got into, you know, what you do now, which is basically teach people and show them through, you know, experience how they can live and eat healthier at the uh, uh, Hippocrates Institute. I know people can go there and really transform their lives like Tim did. So why don't you talk about how you got started and probably some of I've, I have seen some of your talks. I did a little you homework. You still invited me to, to come on to your program here? <laughs> I what did. Are you a I, I may regret it. I don't know. <laughs> well, I've, I haven't regretted any any of my interviews. I've, I've always gotten a lot out of it. So I, you know, I, it's somebody who's dedicated their life to something and has a passion, particularly in the field of health. How can I, how can I go wrong with that? Well, I think you're right. Any, whatever field uh, a person's endeavor is, when you have a purposeful passion for what you do, you are genuine, you're authentic. And there's too few people out there today that were guided correctly to do what they love. And so people are under pain and suffering. So because of that statement, we'll go back to 1952. I was vaguely born. I was just a little one at that point. Knew nothing about health. You know, grew up in a, a typical American family with, in my case, loving parents. Uh, but they were the first drug pushers I met. When I was good, they gave me sugar. When I was bad, they took the sugar away. So that's the training we all had. And then, of course, they listened to the golden rules from the pharmaceutical industries and the, and the food industry that, you know, eating copious amounts of meat and milkshakes and, and ice cream were just good. So I became obese. Uh, I was in my 20-year-old period. And... Um, couldn't walk upstairs, you know, smoking three packs of cigarettes a day and being stoned on grass every day for 10 years didn't help either. But there was a mentor, this wonderful little Jewish gal from New York who was 75, who saw me and took a liking to me. You know, the only two people that liked me at that point, it wasn't me, it was my mother and Lillian Galton. Mm -hmm. and Lillian Galton grabbed me and cursed at me and said, what the hell's wrong with you? You're going to die. And you know, when you're a kid, you don't ever think that mortality is part of this part of the story, but it, it provoked me. I know this little lady didn't know me and she went on to tell me a story that I didn't believe because I was an Irish Catholic and we had giant families. The Pope was very influential, uh, you know, both in the Jewish population and the Catholic population, the religion teaches have babies. Uh, it took me a while to figure out why that was. It was to perpetuate the size of the religion. So I went to a lot of wakes. We didn't call them funerals. We called them wakes. And, you know, the Irish typically got drunk. And there was one of my aunts or uncles or friend of the family laying in a casket. And they would whisper. Nobody would ever tell you why anyone died. I thought, you know, what's going on? Why are they laying there stiff like? And I would hear cancer. So when Lillian said to me that years before, decades before, she was going to die of stage four cancer and she recovered because she changed her diet, it was really unfathomable to believe that. As I got to know her, she was one of the most truth-telling people I ever met. She had an organization uh, here in Florida, in Hollandale, uh, that two, 300 members were there and they all had similar stories. They were all in their 70s and 80s and I was just a baby boy. I was sort of the, the token youth that came in mm -hmm. and she guided me. You know, although I was studying biology and chemistry at that point, and she said, you know, you can't formally learn these things, but uh, meet this wonderful Californian called Paul Bragg and meet this wonderful guy uh, called Bernard Jensen and study with him and get your credential to be a master herbalist from John Christopher. And these were some of the great daddies of the 1950s, 60s, 70s, et cetera, that I was just blessed to be a youngster at that point and studied with him and went on later in my life, became a naturopathic doctor, which by the way, in the state of Florida is a felony. So I tell you I'm a naturopathic doctor, although I am one, I could be arrested 
and then got my doctorate degree in nutrition. So I'm a PhD nutritionist. And uh, the whole thing began in a serious way. I was doing a little bit of talking in the early 70s under the auspices and guidance of this wonderful lady, Mrs. Mrs. Galton. Uh, and then I, I gravitated. I was living in Oregon for a short period of time. It's very hot in Southern Oregon in the summer. It's 100 degrees every day, unlike the rainy part of Oregon where I was, it was the opposite. And I just didn't eat any cooked food. And before you know it, uh, I felt remarkable. Although I had been chosen to be a plant-based eater 51 years ago now, uh, that's all I've been eating since then. And plant-based eater doesn't mean eggs and doesn't mean fish. I haven't eaten any, any animal-based foods in 51 years, raised four kids, have eight grandkids now. Uh, and I felt remarkable on this raw food stuff. And I remember reading a really odd book called Be Your Own Doctor by this strange immigrant called uh, Ann Wigmore, who herself healed advanced cancer uh, in 1952. Uh, she was told by the Harvard doctors, because she was in Boston, she had 90 days to live and went home and employed what she learned as a, a kid in Lithuania. She was a peasant, a poor girl, from her grandmother, the village doctor, and healed it and opened the doors of Hippocrates in 1956. So I, I gravitated to go and visit there. And she said, why don't you work here? And I had no intent living in cold, disgusting, <laughs> cloudy Boston. And, you know, that, that wasn't my cup of tea, uh, but I did. It was, a, I guess, a calling or ambition, blind, blind ambition as a young kid. I said, well, yeah. now I'll, I'll be with my tribe. And I was with my tribe. And, and the work that Anne uh, founded and began is no less remarkable then, maybe even more remarkable than now. At 65 years, Hippocrates has been here. We, she pioneered the field of, of self-care, S-E-L-F care. She realized something that most alternative doctors, holistic doctors still don't get. It's not about the doctor knowing, it's about the patient knowing. We call them guests here. So we educate, we teach, we guide with this deep well of experience and have a reputation as Tim James must have said, of people coming here with incurable diseases. They've been told by the top doctors at Stanford or at Oxford in England or in Australia, uh, the jig is up, that we've done all the treatments we can. And thousands of these people have brought about recovery. Now, this doesn't fit with the model and the mold of modern medicine. So we're not very well favored by pharmaceutical industries because they keep claiming that we say we cure people. We never say that because we don't believe it, that the human body is ex exceptional. I mean, if you study anatomy, you all at once believe in God. Even if you're an atheist, I promise you'll believe in God. Because when you see the brilliance of the immune system and how the organs work and how you can actually propel this into a monstrously effective way to stay young and to prevent everything from cancers to heart disease to diabetes, you start to realize how convoluted our ideologies, philosophies, and education have been on health. They are completely the opposite of what it should be. So Anne Wigmore started that in 1956, the doors opened up. Uh, back then I wasn't there, uh, but they said everyone was dying, you know, pretty much. Uh, we've always had a rule here that you have to walk, talk, think, and feel. But, you know, people would say they did and fall in bed and, and one by one, many of these people recovered. You know, it's absolutely amazing to think that it's not amazing to me, but it's amazing to think yeah. that humans have things in many areas completely backwards completely. And it, from, you know, how they view the world in every single sense. And health, of course, is, is, is a big part of that. Um, and I, you know, I sort of, look at it that my body is something that I can uh, treat um, with reverence in every area and what I put into it. And I'm not, you know, I'm certainly not at the level of uh, health that uh, which, which you practice there. I'm a little bit lazier and a little bit less educated. And um, 
and driven, but I'm pretty healthy compared to most Americans. I'm in, I'm in a high percentage group of, of health. I take no medications and I'm 66 years old. I don't, I'm on nothing. So right. other than, you know, a couple of vitamin type things, but, uh, and, you know, I have a few things that aren't the way I want them, but, but it's pretty, pretty amazing to me that when I go to the doctor and they go, what, you know, what medications are you taking? And I go, none. Yeah. And they're like, what? <laughs> and they've tried to get me to take um, certain things like cholesterol stuff, which I won't do. I won't right. do it. Um, so, and I feel probably pretty good most of the time, and, you know, That's and I'm why. willing to use Not my body as a, huh? You're not on the meds. <laughs> no, no. That's and, it. And, and I'm willing to, you know, um, use my body as a test tube in a sense, you know, like I don't think every food is right for every person because there's certain things I'll eat them. And I just, I'm like, nah, this doesn't work for me. I don't like what this is, how it's okay. making me feel. Of course, you know? in your case, it was fried sausage put through a meatloaf blend. No wonder it didn't taste good. <laughs> <laughs> You know, what's interesting, what's funny about that was when I was a kid, I didn't like meat um, yeah. and it was at every meal and I just didn't, and I was like, I don't want to, and then it was meat with milk. Yeah. Can milk you imagine? Strong bones. And oh. I was like, I can't drink this crap. And, and, um, and the meat bothered me and I still eat, you know, I still eat some um, animal products. Right. Well, let, let's give you your listeners some data on this because Sure. Young men like you, 66-year-old men, here's the real numbers. In the United States, less than 5% of 66-year-old women and men take no medicine. So you're in a very elite group. What you said is not a joke. Mm -hmm. So 95% of Americans take medicines at your age. Now, here's a second whammy on this one. The other 95% take an average of five medicines. Oh. So some are taking 20, some are taking one, but the fact is 95% are taking some form of medicine. Now, in retrospect, let's look back to 1900, where less than 5% of any of the population, forget 66-year-old people, took medicines. That the only medicine that was used is temporarily, it was an herbal medicine, or if you were in Europe, homeopathic medicine. Uh, in the United States, the number three killer now, listen very closely, and challenge anything I say. I'd like you to disagree with me today. That the number three killer, number one is cancer, number two is heart disease, number three is medical pharmaceutical mistakes. Now, that alone should provoke some thought in thinking people, but the bad news is in America, we don't have too many of those people left. And thinking people should say, wait a minute, these are the people that take up 22% of the gross national product, so-called healthcare has nothing to do with health. And even though we spend twice as much as any other country in the world on individual health, it's a third killer. Now that doesn't add up. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. I don't care if you're mentally ill, people should figure that one out. And why? Because we created a system since Rockefeller took over in the 1920s that is a profit-based system. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. One single mistake that they made intentionally is all medicines were plants before 1920s. He was in the oil industry. This bastard basically made medicines out of oil. <laughs> I mean, think about that. And, and, and so how many of you would take a quart of motor oil and ingest it? Now you say, well, it's not the same. Some researcher at Harvard or Stanford, or UCLA, they did the research on it. Don't buy the nonsense you're hearing today. This is a world I come from. Most research is marketing ploys by the pharmaceutical companies that are going to sell and make billions of dollars on you being a victim of the number three killer in America, you taking treatments for diseases that do not work. Let's look at cancer alone. Their own journals, which I happen to read, I wish other doctors did, tell you that if you take medical treatment for, for cancer of any type and do nothing else, 93% of those people will eventually die from cancer. Now, let's just look at this in a practical business-like manner. Imagine if Chevrolet or Ford or 
Dodge uh, had to tell you as you're driving your car or truck off the lot, by the way, there's a 93% chance you may die from driving this car. How long would those companies stay in business? But we don't challenge these people who have cloaked themselves in the glory and arrogance of science. You've been taught since you were a little boy and I was a little boy and girls listening to, to that you're subservient to these people. And the truth of the matter is, this is criminal activity. There's nothing less than criminal activity. Uh, one of the top economists in the world from the University of Chicago said it so well. Once we license a field, a, a professional field, it gives them justification to make it a business, even if it doesn't help. And that's what he, he said about this. So, I mean, what you and I, it, we shared, where do you grow up, by the way? I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. Okay, so we had, from the East, we had similar backgrounds, or, or I'm sure your parents didn't mean to poison you, but they were unwittingly, unwillingly. And oh, yeah. I mean, they they were following the, you know, three basic food groups and they put glasses on me when I was three. They took me to a, 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 a up some kind of doctor and I took them off and I broke them. Yeah. And then they waited a few more years and they did it again. And then progressively, uh, my eyes, you know, because of the dependence on the lenses, they got yeah. worse. Yeah. So, um, what what did some teachers say that you weren't looking at the homework well? Or well, I, I don't know because they they did take us into rooms and did and did eye tests screening oh, at yeah. schools. So now there's a lot of factors in an eye test, obviously, um, and you know there's a whole there's a whole. I mean, we could get into the whole thing about uh, vision and um, you know. But when you're three years old, they could say, "What's that letter? You don't even know." It's, yes. <laughs> bad, bad eyes. <laughs> yeah. Which one? Which is better? This or this? This or this? Yes. And, uh, and I, <laughs> I don't want to be here. That's what this is. That's so exactly. you know, who knows? Who knows what uh, you know? And there are, you know, I I mean, uh, I'm I'm gonna find some um, buddy because I did I did do some of this Bates method. Um, I oh um, yeah, it works. Exercise and it did work. I got lazy and I was busy and I couldn't put in the time. And but it worked. I there were moments, and my prescription got less and less and less. And there were moments I had perfect vision at times, uh, doing the Bates method. And they basically drummed him out of that whole, you know, yeah. ophthalmology. Well, let's, let's explain this because a lot of people listening to your show, especially your show, wear glasses. It's it's camaraderie. So Dr. Bates was around a hundred years ago, and he was a medical doctor that started to notice something that was a new occurrence. More and more people wore glasses. So he correctly surmised when we were agricultural farmers, we were moving our eyes. We heard a bird. We listened to this. We saw the color. We got UV lies in, uh, in our eyes. But now we're on assembly lines. Now we're doing mundane work where our eyes are focused. So he said movement and exercise will bring back the virility of the eye. Now. I'll give you a story. My father-in-law, who's 93 years old in Sweden, doesn't wear glasses. He's a prolific reader. I read a lot. He reads six to seven hours a day, every day, seven days a week. And the fact of the matter is, this guy broke at 45 his glasses and does debates I met to 10 minutes a day. So all of you, anywhere in the world, you're listening to this wonderful guy who has this, this program. You can buy Bates, Dr. Bates' book. It's a very small, inexpensive book. It's in 30 languages around the world. And, and do what he was incapable of doing. Now it's time we're going to do that again. <laughs> yeah. I promise the next time I see you, you're, you're not going to have glasses on. You're going to have a full head of, of blonde hair. And you're going to be wearing a speedo? <laughs> Taller, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, that was, I, it blew me away. I mean, just to, all of a sudden I would, you know, I would just, it would just come into perfect clarity with these exercises. And, um, you know, I think one of the things that he said was uh, all poor eyesight is based on mental strain. Yes. It's not a physical, um, you know, uh, disease from the outside. I mean, if, I guess if you would ask an ophthalmologist or, you know, what, why do people have poor eyesight? I don't know if they actually have a real answer for that. Like what We're causes that? Send more money. We'll research it. Yeah. 
Where's cancer? We don't know where cancer comes from. Not, maybe not radiation that we give you for cancer. We don't know where heart disease comes from. Get off your lazy ass and stop eating all the garbage. That's where it comes from. I, you know, if I, I say to people, if you want to know why uh, the country is, is has a lot of ill health, go to Disneyland and just look wow. at the people. <laughs> that's Disneyland, of course. And that's the happiest place on earth. Oh yeah. And it is it is a uh, a, a swirling mass of obesity and ill health uh, and horrible right. horrible foods. I mean, well, a place I don't even go anymore because it was so depressing. Plus, the guy screws Americans. Is called Walmart. Oh, I've never shopped there. Never. I'm proud of that. If you think Disneyland has poor specimens, (laughs) what's going on? Walmart must have (laughs) stopped these people in the back room. (laughs) And, you know, 90% of them have to drive on carts because they're so big, they can't walk. Wow. That's a whole business. The uh, the rascal, the rascal. (laughs) This is why they had drive through fast food restaurants. Our fat asses can't get out of the car anymore. So we have to drive through. Then, then by the way, nowhere in the world have I ever seen where alcohol consumption when you drive is legal, but now you feel so bad. Now you go to the drive-through alcohol store. And then basically when you get sick from the alcohol and the bad fast food, then you go to the drive-through pharmacy. So I'm, I'm saying this years ago, tongue in cheek, and a woman from Arizona got up when I said, Next, they're going to have drive-through mortuaries. She said, we do have one. And I said, what do you mean? She said, it's in a low-income area, and people who can't afford the ambulance or the funeral home, you actually can drop off your loved one. I said, that's door-to-door from the fast food place to the alcohol place to the pharmacy to the work. <laughs> wow. I guess you could... Well, I can't even imagine driving grandma over to the, 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 that your, drop your her dead off. Gra- Put her out the window. <laughs> <laughs> Crack the window. <laughs> Holy macaroni. Um, should, should we put her in the trunk? Society. <laughs> <laughs> so off. <laughs> that is incredible. A drop off mortuary. Let's talk about another number one. Do you realize that we only have 4% of the world's population? And we take 50% of the drugs, pharmaceutical drugs made yearly. I completely buy that. I, yeah. You should. I mean, challenge anything I say. These, you know, people say, Brian, you have these interesting facts. It's not interesting facts. I'm reporting the insanity of humanity. <laughs> it's what it is. Well, I, you know, all, the thing is, the pharmaceutical companies tell you how bad this stuff is in, at the end of every commercial may cause and then they give this really fast list of horrific things. your eye may pop out your butt may blow up yeah your i mean it's just, come and they didn't have to used to do that but now they do so they get a guy who can talk really clear and fast and they and they just do it right at the end and then they do another teaser for the product they'll show the happy couple you know walking and everything's fine now because of this you even never, though never one of these people they use these models or actors that, who look sick they all look sexy you know, what the hell? They're not sick people. We all say, hey, I want to be like them. Let me take the drug. <laughs> <laughs> the drug that makes ugly people uh, pretty. That's hey, did we- you ever see the John Oliver segment? He did a 10-minute te- a segment. I use this when I'm traveling and lecturing around the world. He actually critiques this entire thing. And they have the stereotypical sexy woman who's a pharmaceutical rep who comes into a middle-aged doctor who's just happy to see somebody and they go out to lunch together and they start throwing money around, you know, but, but I'm sure it's on the internet. Look up John Oliver and exposing pharmaceuticals on that. And it's just, it's just poignant. Uh, That's all I can say about it. So let's talk about some other things. What do you want to talk about? I want to talk about sugar. Oh yeah. And then I want to talk about, the current um, pandemic and your take on that. So let's talk sugar first, because I think it's a huge problem. I had a problem with it. Um, To me, it's as close to cocaine as you can get. It looks like it. It has the same similar effects. Uh, It it caused me uh, uh, bad uh, sleep, uh, uh, jaw grinding, uh, stomach issues, um, tiredness, all kinds of stuff. Uh, Other than the taste, I I really did not do well with it. No. Well, you know, this is, again, 
my 51st year of doing this work, I've worked with 275,000 people. And if you said, Brian, you can only say one word of the one thing you want everyone to give up with, we're now discussing it, sugar. So one of my 30 books I, I wrote is called Sweet Disease. And every chapter in that book, I give you the easy to understand fifth grade level reading of why scientifically that specific disease is either directly created from eating sugar or, or grown or developed or expanded by eating sugar. Now, one of the reports I give in that book is, is stunning. Princeton, pretty notable, good college out here in the East, uh, did a study where they looked with MRIs at the brains of people on cocaine, as you said, heroin, and sugars. Now, let me qualify what I mean by sugars. They didn't only look at the notorious white sugar and brown sugar and honey and maple syrup, but even fruit sugar. Mm -hmm. because even though you think of these in different ways due to marketing, industry marketing, the body doesn't decipher the difference. You can be as addicted to fruit sugar as you can white sugar. So now, part of the brain lights up with cocaine. That's why you get perpetually addicted to it. Part of your brain lights up with heroin. It's a different part. 100% of your brain lights up with any form of sugar. Now think of this. So even though I was a, a great meat lover and dairy, I think my entire diet was 80% meat and dairy. Uh, when I, at 20 years old, abandoned all of that and gained back my, I didn't gain back, I finally received my, my humanity at that point, uh, I gave up meat in a day. It took me two more years, three more years, gave up all dairy food. It took me 35 years to give up sugar. Now here I'm a, an internationally renowned nutritional scientist traveling around the world telling you how bad sugar is. And I would leave the stage and go out and eat three, four mangoes or half a, me a melon, 30 pound melon. I'm not joking. I mean, yeah. this is an evil addiction that Princeton and now other organizations tell you 30 times, three zero times more addictive than heroin or cocaine. So those of you out there listening and saying, what's my biggest psychological and physiological problem, we're now discussing it. And if you want to lose weight, if you want to get rid of cancer, if you want to reduce, eliminate diabetes, these are prerequisites to elimination of sugar. And it's so hard to do. I'm telling you, here I'm telling you, I'm confessing to you, 35 years. I just changed the name of the sugar and justified it by its organic fruit. It's the same shit as far so, as the body's concerned. Do you eat no fruit whatsoever? I eat no fruit. Oh, okay. Fruit is not part of my diet. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that's not a much better choice than candy bars for most people. So I'm not sitting here like Nazi nutrition guy. Yeah. I'm telling you that sometimes you have to make a transition. Now, if you have fungal diseases, yeast problems, a lot of you have this. You may not even know it. Uh, cancers, low blood sugar, high blood sugar. You have to avoid all sugars as, as hard as it is. These are the spark plugs for your problem. Mm. You don't get rid of them. You'll never get well, period. You just won't get well from candida. You won't get well from cancer. Uh, I, I've seen this. Now, number two, if you don't have one of the above problems, you may say, okay, I'm going to come off the, I used to eat whole boxes of Reese's Buttercups as a kid. That's not a joke. The entire box with whatever there were, 12 or 25. I don't, sure. I, I once you get, why stop once you get started? <laughs> whole boxes of cookies. You know? Uh, you know. So let's get rid of that and at least take the mangoes and take the organic watermelons and stuff. You know? Now, the ironic part of this, the anthropological part of this story, is that the original diet of man was fruit. So if I'm saying one thing, why am I saying it? Is yeah. Brian speaking out of two sides of his mouth? It took me... Matter of fact, it happened in California where I met an agricultural scientist who finally met me, led me to the literature. This goes back 40 years ago. And I couldn't find anything referencing this in any language in medical literature. And he said, you know, the Chinese started to hybrid fruit to have more sugar in thousands of years ago. I'm not talking about 500 years ago, two, 3,000 years ago they were doing this. And to equate it, he said, the, the fruit today 
has dozens and dozens of times more sugar than the original fruit. Now, when you top that all off with the fact that you and I, uh, our families, uh, you don't look like uh, you came from the aristocracy, and I certainly didn't. <laughs> yeah. If we didn't, if we didn't come from the aristocracy, our families never ate processed sugar. Period. Processed sugar was only for the elite of the elite, the kings, queens, princesses, etc. Period. So 150 years ago, it would have been off the slavery in great part was created by the sugar industry. Look into that. It's really an interesting story. I don't want to get off on that tangent yeah. though. Mm -hmm. That would uh, make sense actually. Yeah, it is. The fact of the matter is that now your pancreas broke because in the last five or six generations, you and I were brought up on massive amounts of sugar. This poor little organ in our body that's regulating and adjusting sugar, which is an incredibly important fuel for every one of your 100 trillion cells, the thing has been, been overtaxed. So now when you take any form of sugar that's 25, 35, 45 times more than the original fruit would have, basically your pancreas can't handle it. So it turns out in your blood. Now, yes, we have a disease called diabetes. It's a blood sugar disease. But by the way, when it's in the blood, it feeds fungus, it feeds yeast, it feeds viruses, it feeds bacteria, it feeds cancer. Not because we say so. This is 101 biological science mm -hmm. we're talking about. Yeah. Now, let me add to that because I, I talked about anthropology. Anthropologists are now showing us through teeth observation. All these hundreds of years, anthropology, they're finally doing their work. They looked at the teeth and they said, we were frugivorous and eating herbs. We didn't even eat nuts, seeds, grains, and beans, to be honest with you. The only time we did that was when we had droughts. So they brought the geologist in and said, why are these indentations in the teeth for this five-year period? And the geologist was stunned when they said, that was the time where there was major droughts. So all of the plants withered up and the seeds were left. So our bodies were eating very, very fluid, highly nutritious foods, low sugar contents. But remember, sugar is important. You need glucose for energy in the cell. But a 200-pound man could get all the glucose you need from two green salads a day, moderate-sized green salad. You don't need anything more than that. So when you get more than that, it, it actually begins the evil process of setting up the environment for every disease known to man. In the books I write for the academic community, a series called Food is Medicine, I talk about the best way to age is eat a lot of sugar. Forget the fact you're worried about getting a disease. Uh, you want to look better, don't eat sugar. You know, I'm 70 now. I feel like I'm a 20-year-old kid. Yeah, you look really fit. Well, I am fit, but the yeah. fact is I'm not going to brag about it. It's just I'm on the plan uh, that, that we were intended to be on, you know. I have a question about uh, people that are overeaters that cannot, that have cravings and cannot stop and, yeah. and, you know, no, and have studied some of this stuff, but they, you know, the, the cravings are so great. I know a lot of people like this that are really, they can't seem to, sometimes it's triggered by an emotional uh, moment where, you know, I feel scared or insecure and I, I eat food is the solution to, you know, not dealing with the feelings, but is, is there a biological thing that's going on where somebody can mitigate those cravings and stay on, you know, is there a period of adjustment that can be done to change that? Or is this a little bit of a psychological disorder too? Well, let's talk about the majority being psychological. It's, it's what I call the fill factor. When you're not loved, when you have a job you hate, you're in a marriage that's broken, your child's on drugs, what, whatever these traumatic things are that are going on in the world today. You're sitting in the house for the last nine months. And you know these things are enough to make people try to suppress their emotions in their gut. Because if you don't suppress your emotions in your gut and keep the energy going there to push out this waste, it comes up to the heart. And then you've got to do something people aren't prepared to do, feel. And so how you stop feeling and stop thinking is as I did when I weighed 120 pounds more and began all of this, is you sedate yourself. Mm -hmm. So you're smart enough to say, I'm not a drug addict. I'm not an alcoholic. It's no different, man. So that's number one. Now, is there a biological component? Absolutely. You have hormones in your brain 
I mean, it just again, it's exciting to study this stuff. The neuron scientists have opened up new avenues in the last 30 years that we didn't even suspect. And, and these hormones are satiated. And if they're not working correctly because you're nourishing them, now, if you're not eating a nourishing diet, you could eat and eat and eat as I did and as millions to hundreds of millions of people do every and never have that satiate, never have that hormone say, hey, you've been fed, let's stop eating. You know what it feels like. All of the listeners out there know what I'm talking about. At some point in your life, you ate enough of healthy food where your body said, I don't need more. It just sort of shuts down. But if you don't have that measure, you don't have that switch that goes off, there is a biological factor. Now, combined with emotionality and suppression of emotions, this is a lethal combination. I mean, look at 72% of our children in this country are obese, morbidly obese, or overweight. Now, that's outrageous. Back in 1965, 66, when they looked at the kids that went to Vietnam, the victims they sent to Vietnam, they basically showed they were alarmed at 21% of the, the youth in, that, in this country were overweight at this point. You think we, we, we're stopping that? It's going to get worse and worse. I mean, 40% of our, no, 50% of our young 40-year-old men in this country cannot sexually perform. Their libido is dead. Why? Because their veins are clogged with fat. They're sitting on their ass. They're stressed. They're in front of electromagnetic computers all day long, stuck to their head and their genitalia with laptop computers. No, I'm surprised that it's only 50%. And women aren't much better off. 60% have libido problems today. And so when you really look at the scope of our out of control lifestyles, it is destroying us individually, as a nation, as a humanity. And you can't tell me that this doesn't have a major effect on these leaders when they live on fast food and sugars. It does. And I, the latest book I wrote is called Manopause. And it's name. actually about andropause. And I, I critique that. A political statement I make is if, if men could realize that we have, as Erickson said, cycles of life, periods of life, and we're not the virile 20-year-olds at 60 and 70 we were then, but if our social abnormalities and our demands upon masculinity show that you've got to be a machivo guy at 50, 60, and sexy guy at 60, you know, you can't live up to that. You don't have the hormonal activity to live up to that. So what we have is abuse, uh, men running around with young chicks all of the time, guys getting drugged up on alcohol or, or drugs of some type, or sugar, which I used to do. And you know, remember, men sexually peak at 19, women sexually peak at around 40. So this whole concept of, of Beverly Hills, where you're close to, these old farts like me are running around with 20-year-old chicks, it should be reversed. The old women should be running around with young stud puppies. <laughs> Boy, who set up that menu? I don't know. I know. I, I got, God, God's laughing at us. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, the schism in the world comes from bad leadership. I think all people want the same thing. We want to love and be loved. I don't think there's a right and a left. I don't think there's black and white people. I think there's good people and shitheads. And that's it. <laughs> and our job is is to get the shitheads to realize they want to be loved. And the yeah. way to you want to be loved is not to hate. You want to be loved is not to, to bash things and break things down and make people wrong. If we can make everyone right or a little bit right, and even the worst among us, and believe me, there's plenty of those, if we just embrace these people and gave them a little bit of what they're crying out for, you know, these, this, level of insanity you see coming out of some people, the hatred that they spew. They're just crying out and saying, please, hug me, love me, tell me I'm I have some security. You know, imagine uh, the data that came out last year <clears throat> that when they polled people in Europe, North America, Canada, the United States, and asked them, you can only answer this in one or two ways. Do you love or hate your job? 80% said they hated their job. Mm. That, that, 
Now, that's where we spend a minimum of 40 hours a week. Yeah. And then we go home to rest to go back and do more. <clears throat> Here's the other boner. Every one of us want partners. Now, you may say, no, I don't, because you had bit. You cry out for somebody you, when you can come home. And you have somebody as my wife of 42 years. When I have a tough day, I'm working with somebody here, a kid with brain cancer. I'm a man. You know, I'm not first a professional. I'm a man. That rips my heart out. I have somebody to go home where we console each other. Mm -hmm. We all want that. But 90% of people do not have good marriages. Only 10% of people have good partnerships. That's scary. So you hate what you do. You hate being at home. And so people start to take hobbies up that are mental sick hobbies. <laughs> you know, it's, I'm going to join this club because this is a club of haters that resonate with my level of hate, or I'm going to rip down this building, or I'm going to uh, join this, this party. All we want to do is be recognized and loved. And if we could just nurture that, and could you imagine the amount of suffering we would stop if we had people on a healthy lifestyle and diet? I know if you gave me the, the keys to the world and a team of dedicated mission-oriented professionals, I want you to join this too, by the way. And we, within three years, could wipe out 80% of all the diseases. Could you imagine the economic impact that would have on the global population? And I'm not joking. I'm not sitting here blowing a horn. These are things I've thought about, and we've run the math on them. Yeah, I was talking, uh, actually talking to my wife about this. The first thing you were talking about is creating life for people where they feel good rather than, than hate. You know, there's a lot of um, energy to uh, being angry Most and, of it. and being self-righteous and being right. And uh, uh, there, there is uh, adrenaline, which is a, an amazingly strong drug <laughs> that, and it, so it keeps fueling it. And I, you know, I agree. I always say that everybody wants the same thing, yeah. which is what you were talking about. And why as a species are we so uh, blocked from, from doing that? Is it just, I don't know what it is. It's, I mean, some of it's just ignorance and, and uh, you know, the people that are the sickest seem to have a drive to control other people and they make that a full-time job and they get there because of it too. That's another part of it. Well, let, let me, let me give you some of my observations humbly. Uh, you know, I'm sitting in the seat I am, I'm seeing people in their most broken and authentic time here on the Hippocrates campus. So people don't come in and embellish with me. They don't exaggerate, 99% of them. They don't lie. You know, they come here and they open-heartedly and open-mindedly say, can you help me? Now, half the people that come here are not sick. They're just conscious people that don't want to age. They don't want to sick. But I'm talking about this precious group of people I've had the privilege to work with since 1970 or so. And... When I'm with these people, they've taught me so much I couldn't learn any other way. They taught me at the end of the day that what they're remorseful of is the lack of, of support and care that they gave to the people who loved and supported them. I hear about mothers all of the time. I wish I had treated my children better. I'm even guilty that I wasn't abusive to my children. I was just an absent father. You know, Now I'm trying to make up for the relationships I didn't have when I was working seven days a week and traveling the globe 200 days a year. You know, mm -hmm. you, you can't make up for that. You know, <clears throat> in the farm community, you sat with your family. You knew it, they were out in the fields with you. That's gone at this point, or greatly gone. So why people want power is when they have no control. And rarely we get a person who has control. When they take power, they eliminate them. Because stable people create stability. Leadership that's stable creates stability within a culture, a society, and a country. When you get the Mahatma Gandhis, they can't handle them. When you get the Martin Kings, they can't. When you get the Jack Kennedys and the Robert Kennedys, they can't handle them. And so they eliminate them because they're telling you that life can be good. They're telling you that everything is perfectly possible. You know. It's Robert Kennedy, before they assassinated him right there in Los Angeles, said it beautifully just a few weeks before. You don't do something because it's easy. You do it because it's hard. And hard is good. Hard builds character. And hard builds strength. And so when I'm with these people who are told they're going to die, and I watch them get well, 
from brain cancer, liver cancer, pancreatic cancer, multiple stroke, Parkinson's disease, HIV, the list goes on. It's not because it's easy to do that. It's because it's hard to do it, but they respect and honor and, and love themselves and have gratitude enough to do it. And all of you are capable of doing it. But if you join the clubs and you're a cheerleader for negativity, you deserve to go down. That's what I say at this point. I think the universe takes care of it. Well, the one thing that I got the most out of um, when both my parents were dying was yeah. that there was nothing there except love. That was it. I love you. We said it a million times back and forth. All personality, all characteristics, all uh, all things that would, didn't, didn't go right all those years, whatever, yeah. and it didn't mean a thing. It was just, it was all about love and connection. What a beautiful thing you had an opportunity to do that. Did I hear you say that both were dying at the same time? Not at the same time, no. They were three years apart, but I had that experience both times. Wow. Um, and it was, um, you know, it was like there was a, it literally just on the deepest level in my heart, everything was stripped away. And I think they felt that way, too. It was just life force and energy and love. And that was it. Um, not to say there were difficulties during the day to, you know, sort of deal with illness and situations, but um, that really was what it came down to. And, and if we, if we as a species can, you know, feel that on some level, and I think most people do, yeah, they uh, do. in those moments and why the distractions of survival are so um, can be so uh, off that people don't, they forget it. You know, it's easy to forget during the day when you're trying to survive well, I immediately, I immediately connected with you. Now you're telling me why. You know, you you have you have a genuineness about you that I don't really find in many people, and so probably that stems from the fact that you had this upbringing with people that were your friends, and that's what moms and dads should be. They should be your best friends. They should be the people you trust. And when things go bad, you go back and they hug and you they console you. You know, that's the thing. So now I know why I like you. <laughs> oh, I like you. <laughs> You're stable. <laughs> in some well, way. you know, for the most part, yeah, I think that it's uh, uh, you know an important. You know, I one of the things that when my when my father was passing away, uh, I was um, it was not that long ago, and he lived to be ninety four. Mm, great. And I was in my sixties, so I and I remember thinking, well, if I live to the same age as my dad, I'm two thirds of the way through my life right, right now how do I want to spend that last third? What is my, you know, am I going to spend it worrying? Am I going to spend it being angry at people? Am I going to spend it? Uh, you know, what have I, you know, what, what, what do I, what's important and what do I need to get, just get rid of? And, you know, one of the things was I wanted to experience more joy uh, because I, that's been a, a difficult thing for me for whatever a combination of reasons. Oh, right? you, you did grow up in the Midwest. Come on. I did. <laughs> I did. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm walking around earth, you know, with, yeah, with that's, people, that's, you know, yes. <laughs> <laughs> not an easy place. You know, no, I've yeah. never lived on other planets. You have, but... very pious. you have to be pious. Don't get too excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, and I thought, well, man, let's, let's get rid of this stuff. These anchors that I've, you know, self-imposed and um, some imposed from the outside that I've allowed all that kind of stuff. And it, it, it's like, my life is better now at this age than it was when I was younger. And how long have you been with your wife? Uh, 27 years. And she shares that same sentiment with you? Yeah. Most of the time. Isn't that wonderful? most of the time we're on the same page. It's pretty amazing. It, 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 marriage is, is a way to mold yourself back to where you came from. You Ooh. know, when we come here, we, you know, the whole perception as we get older, we become wiser is nonsense. You come here completely wise, and then they work on you. You know, even the, the, the parents, we, the wonderful parents we had, you know, they, it's like they have hammers and chisels, and they start, like, you can't do that, can't do this, can't say that, can't, you're a boy, you're a girl, you're black, you're white, you're Jew, you're Christian, blah, 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 blah. They start chipping away. Once they're done working you over, they send you to school. <laughs> Now they have a jackhammer. <laughs> and, and then if you're really unfortunate, they're really stuck on religion. Then they send you in for the polishing. That's where they take sandpaper and work on your brain at that point. You know, so no wonder we have 
we have such a self-doubt that we are not ever taught the truth, that life is good, that anything you should dream of doing, you should be able to do, that humans are wonderful and we should, are here to support and to love one another, that relationships, be it love relationships or work relationships, should be something that you enjoy, not something you, you worry about. You know, and, and, and the struggle, when a struggle goes away, the disharmony goes away, the discord goes away, and by the way, the disease goes away. So everyone that comes on this campus as a guest, they get psychotherapy. And oh, I, I didn't know that piece of it. That's interesting. Every, okay. The most, I, ha I have to eat my sprouts on there. I can't say crow, but I have to eat my sprouts <laughs> on this one. Yeah. <laughs> the fact of the matter is that the most important thing we do here is psychotherapy. If we don't find the blockages, the demons, and they may not even be profound. You may not have been beaten or abused one way or another as a child. You may have not resolved an issue as a young woman or a young man that's blocking you, why you have the breast cancer, why you have the pancreatic problem, is that. So we go back to that eating thing. Well, the eating's a representation of the, how you either loathe yourself or honor yourself. You know, and a, a good friend of mine, he, he taught for many years law and psychology up at an Ivy League university, said to me years ago, you have a much easier job than me when I'm seeing patients. And I said, why? He said, you can evaluate the state of mind they have by the choices they make. So look at the choices you're making and I'm making and everyone else is making. And that evaluates the level of self-care and love and respect you have and gratitude you have or lack of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always um, ask people that I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, that if they ask me for advice or one of the exercises I have uh, people do is I want you to write down what you believe about every category of your life. What do you believe about money? What do you believe about politics? What do you believe about sex? What do you believe about aging? What do you believe, you know, anything you can think of. And it's, you know, some of the stuff that I came up with for myself was so off. Um, it's funny, isn't it? How and I was like, man, I, you know, uh, here's, here's a classic one. If somebody's wealthy, yeah. they must be criminal or evil because only those people get money. Money yeah, is yeah, bad. Yeah, yeah. It's not either That's thing. Religion did, that to you. religion did that to you. Probably. I don't know. Yeah. Somebody may, did it. <laughs> may not even be religious, but it's it, remember, you, your country was based upon Judeo Christian theology. So, it, you know, what was its statement out of the it's harder for a rich man to get to heaven than a camel to go through a <laughs> or something. No, come, that's embedded in your head. You're four years old and they're saying this nonsense to you. At the bottom is, is what do I believe and why do I believe it? And is it accurate? And does it serve me and the rest of the people around me? Hard questions, I, but worth the asking. Hardest job, the hardest job I have, and I think you have, or any of us have, is forgetting what we think about others. But thinking a lot about yourself and how to, how to progress, how to improve. I mean, I, I sit here and preach it and every day I struggle with it, you know, right. to, to really say, what am I bullshitting on? What are, what are, am I not engaging myself in? I'm talking a good game, but I'm not engaging myself fully. You know, why would you be doing those things? You know, these are the questions you read because pretense makes you be something that you're not. And, authenticity basically makes you who you are. And if you're not ready to accept who you are, you keep diverting the attention to fake, to the, to the make-believe. You know, it, it's amazing. You know, we puff our, we, we're like these turkeys that puff up our chest and we crow and we walk around and then our peacock feathers come out rather than say, hey, you know, uh, you hear people say to me, when I was a kid, I used to say something and a friend of mine stopped me. After every second set, sentence, I would say, you got to bleed me. <laughs> and she said, you know, do you know what you're saying? And I said, but that's not what I mean. She said, yes, it's what you mean. Why? You don't trust yourself. And I was too young to get it, but I finally got it. Why would I constantly tell you, remind you, you got to bleed me? I felt insecure. I felt I wasn't being straightforward. So these are the little things. You know, they have this wonderful system, and I don't know much about it. I've just seen it effectively help people. 
called Neuro Linguistic Programming. You know oh, I mean? just did a, 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 a talk yesterday with somebody on that very topic. Oh, is it, well, talk about it, because I don't know much. Tell why that works to people. Well, it really is getting down to, you know, uh, b ingrained beliefs that, that uh, you know, aren't serving. And, and it really is, uh, you know, where did it come from? How old is it? Is it in your family system? Um, what is it causing you to do or not do? And uh, it really gets down to just uh, giving people permission to, to, to say to themselves, this is really what it is. This is the deepest level of why I am acting this way. You know, it's like a lot of people, the, the woman I interviewed was saying like a lot of people come to her for, um, I hate my job and I, I, I'm not doing the thing I love. Yeah, and, yeah. Find, and then they find out, well, maybe it's because you don't think that, uh, you know, you're capable of doing this thing you say you that want. We don't think about that. Yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or you're afraid of the success of it because your belief that successful people get knocked off by other people or aren't liked. Exactly. I had that belief, by the way, that um, I'm going to be the guy that is a really great guy that's not going to ever get to a certain point because I didn't like people that had, had risen to a level and I resented them. So therefore, oh, those other people are going to resent me if I do well. Yeah. So I'm going to I'm going to get people to like me for being the guy that's not getting what he wants, but he's a great guy. Yeah. Can you imagine the difference if you and I were brought up in a healthy society that said, by the way, not only should you have everything you want and we're going to support you to do that, but everyone else should have exactly what they need. Now, this would be a chaos at this point because people, yeah. <laughs> they need a lot of things they don't need. I need million dollars. I need this. I need this. Kind. If we could just get all of the nonce, the smoke out of the room, and we take what genuinely we need. Can you imagine? I'd raise the people up. Oh, you know, it'd be awesome. Coretta so King was one of my closest friends. And uh, not only was she a friend, but became my mentor over years. Because I perceive what I've been doing for years, not work or, or business, it's, it's a mission. And she was my mission mentor, as I said. And I remember having a really, as we're having, a nice conversation, an honest, open conversation. I said to her, didn't you ever doubt what you were doing? I mean, you had a thousand, this is a fact, a thousand death set, threats a day. Her, yeah. her family's home was firebombed. She had to drag the kids out in the night. Martin was stabbed. Uh, you know, he was eventually assassinated. But the fact of the matter is, I said, didn't you ever doubt that? And she said something so uh, opening to my mind and enlightening to me. She said to me, you know, when you do something that you completely submit to, that's larger and bigger than you, and you can be part of that tapestry, you never doubt what you do. Isn't that a nice way to look at that? Wow, so, I mean, so the things that you and I succeed with, and anyone listening out there anywhere in the world are that level. We never succeed if we hold back an inch. We only succeed when we submit ourselves fully. And that's the message I have for you today. So it's been a pleasure to be on with you all of this time. I'd like to be on again. You know, if you were here living in Florida, we'd be buddies, I'm sure. I think we, that's yeah. very, very possible. Yeah, you're so nice much guy. better looking than me, though. So I don't uh, know. If I don't I, know. About I'd, that. I'd feel threatened. I, I don't have that cap on. <laughs> <laughs> make well, make the here. world great. There's nothing that's here. Amazing. No so hair. <laughs> look, you, I have a hell of a lot harder time. I've got to comb this damn thing. <laughs> off. But is that make the world great hat? No. <laughs> you, you got you got to go out and get that hat embroidered. Forget just America. Make humanity great. Make the world great, and make all of our lives great. Until the next time, be well, everyone. Enjoy, liberate yourself so that you don't have pain and suffering. You become healthy. Hope to see you here at Hippocrates sometime. Wow, great ending, Brian. Thank you so I much for you. being on the show. <laughs> be well. Much appreciation for you listening to The Exploding Human. Check out the website, theexplodinghuman.com. And if you care to support the show, follow the link there to Patreon, and uh, you will get some extra content. That uh, extra content from today's episode will be all about the pandemic and Brian Clement's take on what that is all about. Very interesting stuff. Also, I have a YouTube channel, The Exploding Human with 
Bob Nickman, and I can be found on Facebook, The Exploding Human. So thank you so much for listening in. Big, big thanks to Brian Clement. Hope to talk to him again. Have a great day. Thank you.